Um, good afternoon. My name is Reed McAlpine. I'm the Ward 3 Councillor for the City of Markham and also Council's representative on the Markham Public Art Advisory Committee. It is therefore a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this international online summit, Becoming Public Art. This exciting nine-week event is presented by the City of Markham in, part, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in partnership with Art Plus Public Unlimited. I'd like to begin our proceedings with a land acknowledgement. We begin today by acknowledging that we walk on the traditional territories of indigenous peoples, regardless of where we're actually uh, are today attending this event. And we recognize their history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land. We are grateful to all indigenous groups for their commitment to protect the land and its resources. And we are committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. I'm really pleased um, that an artist, an artist as recognized and as experienced in the field as Ken Lum is able to join us today to deliver the keynote address. I look forward to hearing him speak about the important role of public art in society today, something that I believe, believe in a great deal. I know that we will learn a lot from him and what he has to say this afternoon. Um, I'm equally excited by the next eight weeks uh, of events that, um, or excuse me, not eight weeks, but eight events um, that have been so carefully put together by the summit's co-curators, Yan Wu and Rebecca Carbon. They will cover uh, virtually every aspect of contemporary public art practice in the 21st century. This summit and the talks and research that come out of it will become a tremendous resource, not just for the city of Markham, but for individuals, collectives, public servants, and municipalities around the globe that are interested in imagining contracting, fabricating, installing, and caring for public art in all its forms. Now over to the co-curators of this event, Yan Wu, the public art curator for the city of Markham, and Rebecca Carbon of Art Plus Public Unlimited. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor McAlpine. And um, I'm just, uh, give me a, one second. Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Yan Wu, Public Art Curator for the City of Markham. Thank you all for joining us today. We are thrilled to see how well attended today's event is. Um, actually, I'm very glad that um, um, Councillor McAlpine are here to open the summit for us. The very idea of it directly came out of a conversation with you in one of our advisory um, uh, advisory committee meetings last fall. At the time when we were about to bring forward the public art master plan to the city council for approval, we tried to strategize how to erase awareness and the potential impact of the plan. More importantly, figuring out the best practice to implement it. What are the models are, how to move forward, especially for an em emerging public art program like ours, still in the process of developing infrastructures and procedures. Um, we thought, why not create occasion to gather all the great working models at one place and let's study them together. Moreover, we want to hear everyone's voice along the production line from artist to curator, planner to architect, designer to fabricator, creator to administrator. Public art making is a collective effort that demands highly complex processes and negotiations. So as soon as the council approve our plan, we brought Re public art consultant Rebecca Carbing on board to design the summit together with us. It has been an absolutely wonderful experience. Thank you, Rebecca, for your knowledge, passion, and determinacy, and above all, your firm belief in public art. Originally, the summit was supposed to be a three-day in-person event back in June. Because of the COVID, we had to change it to today's format. We were a bit disappointed at the beginning, but now look at it. We're able to reach out to a global audience, a global community. Looking forward to our exchange and discussions in the um, coming nine weeks. Like every one of you here, I'm eager to hear what Ken will share with us today. Thank you, Ken, for being part of this summit. You are the anchor piece. Your contribution is not only today's presentation, but also being an example of the standard we want to achieve. Better Not Let Ken Down was the guiding principle driving us through the planning of this summit. Thank you for being a great artist of our time. 
Also, thanks to everyone at the city of Markham for making this summit happen. The amazing team at the Varley Art Gallery and the great support from the team at Corporate Communication and IT. Lastly, thank you Canadian Art for co-presenting today's talk with us. It's a great honor um, to have this partnership with you. Now over to my collaborator, Rebecca Carbon. <laughs> You're muted, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. And it's been an, uh, an absolute pleasure to develop this project together with you as well. Um, thanks, Councillor McAlpine. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today from wherever you are. We're thrilled to be sharing Ken's work with you. A couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce our co-presenter for this keynote lecture. Um, after Ken's talk, we'll have a moderated Q&A. So please use the Q&A box to input questions. And Jan and I will co-facilitate feeding these to Ken once we open the floor for question and answer. Ken's lecture is the kickoff, as we've mentioned, to a nine-week summit program, and we're really excited about the lineup we have pulled together. So please join us for all or some of the following sessions. Same time and place, which is 1.30 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we cover a range of topics relevant to contemporary public art practices from a range of perspectives, all built on the premise of examination through case studies and working models. So over the next, uh, well, over nine weeks from today, uh, we'll cover collaborative practices, civic role for artists, art in the context of urban planning, public art and accessibility, placemaking, site specificity, temporary programming, and digital public art commissioning. And uh, once we get, once I hand over the mic, I'm going to paste the registration link into the chat so you can put all of these in your calendar and sign up for all or some of the sessions that interest you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jane Wilkinson, Editor-in-Chief of Canadian Art Magazine, who is co-presenting the keynote lecture with us today. Jane Wilkinson is an art writer, editor, and independent curator, currently Editor-in-Chief at Canadian Art, which is Canada's largest contemporary art publication. Jane has contributed art criticism to a variety of online and print publications, including artist books, catalogs, and gallery publications. She holds an MA in Art History and Critical Theory from uh, the University of British Columbia, and her research blends interest in surveillance culture, environmental politics, security, and representation with a focus on contemporary art and photo-based practices. Jane Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction. Um, and thanks so much to you and Yan for um, all of your dedicated work putting together this um, wide-ranging and very timely summit uh, on issues in public art. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here uh, on behalf of Canadian Art as a co-presenter on the keynote, and it's truly an honor to be introducing such a renowned and critically engaged artist as Ken Lum. Few artists are able to navigate the conceptual and practical challenges of making art in public with the rigor, thoughtfulness, wit, and historical context that Ken Lum brings to his work. He's made lasting and vital contributions to civic space in cities around the world, uh, including his well-known monument for East Vancouver, uh, also known as the East Van Cross, or the iconic Melisham Hates Her Job billboard, uh, which is now permanently installed on the museum formerly known as the Wit de Wit Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam. This, I think, is a true example of the impact that public art can have on its publics, as the institution is now being renamed the Meli Art Institute in honor of this work and its important relationship to the city. Blum also has a long record of publishing and writing about art, work collected in the recent volume Everything is Relevant, Writing on Art and Life, 1991 to 2018, uh, and which also includes some of his work as a contributor to Canadian art. Many of you will already know the details of his biography and many accomplishments, um, but I'll capture some key points here. Uh, he was born and raised in Vancouver, is now based in Philadelphia, where he is professor in the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania and chair of the Department of Fine Art. His work has been showed widely internationally, including at Documenta, the Venice Biennale, the Shanghai Biennale, the Carnegie International, and the Whitney, among many other solo and group exhibitions. Uh, and this year, Lum was awarded both the Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts and the Gershon Iskowitz Prize. Uh, and in 2017, was appointed an Officer of the Order of Canada. Over the last several years, one of his key projects has been working as co-founder of the Monument Lab, a public art and history studio in Philadelphia that cultivates and facilitates critical conversations around the past, present, and future of monuments. This work was recently recognized with a three-year Mellon Foundation grant to develop national art and justice initiatives, the first grant awarded from the Foundation's larger Monuments Project, uh, which aims to transform the way national histories are told in public space. 
Together, I think Lum's work offers us so many different avenues to consider the relationships between art and its histories, alongside the current social and political realities of our world. In this presentation, he will lay out key points for artists to consider the role of public art in society, as well as an understanding of this moment as a monuments moment, one brought about by the unprecedented changes to our collective existence under a global pandemic, catalyzing a re-examination of public space and the institutions that govern it. So please join me in welcoming Ken Lum. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jane. That's very kind of you. Um, I hope I live up to, to, uh, to, uh, to that uh, uh, just generosity. And thank you to, um, can people see me? Oh, sorry. And thank you to um, uh, Ian Wu and uh, Rebecca Carbon for uh, organizing this. I know how much work is involved in organizing uh, summits. Uh, uh, my regret is, uh, you know, the pandemic has uh, precluded the possibility of, of, um, of uh, in 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 body pre uh, presentation. But um, as as Yan noted, um, it uh, it opens it up uh, in a democratic sense to uh, more participants. Uh, uh, than otherwise. And thank you also for uh, Reed McAlpine for your work uh, on Markham City Hall uh, and uh, for public art. So without further ado, I'm going to start uh, my uh, paper and then I'm going to, uh, after a little while, I'll start uh, PowerPoint and then I'll go back to uh, the paper. We are living in a social justice moment, a moment long in gestation in which COVID-19 has underlined the consequences of a social order built on racism, social just, injustice, and profound inequity. The coronavirus has become a catalyst for a re-examination of our public space and the institutions that govern it. The confluence of crisis has also made explicit the damage that human culture has wrought on the world's environmental footprint. While the virus and its shelter in place orders have brought air pollution relief in many places. It was habitat loss due to human encroachment that catalyzed the virus and its now global dispersal. The present moment is calamitous, but it has made clear humanity's ineluctable interdependence one to another. The interdependence extends to the natural world, both organic and inorganic and all that makes life on earth possible. New imaginings of social life are called for. Imagine a future environment of greater human connectedness. Imagine fewer cars on the road. Imagine a safer and healthier built environment. Imagine a nurturing relationship to and by nature. Imagine public spaces that can be practiced upon in truly democratic ways. Imagine public art that calls forth a public to practice upon it, producing public discourse and public space through the encouragement of diverse spatial practices. We are living in a monuments moment, a moment in which the silent and unquestioned status of monuments can no longer be tolerated for its symbolic projection of racism, sexism, colonialism, and countless historical oppressions. Along with the felling of monuments is the felling of hegemonic narratives that have made claims to collective memories. Monuments transmit institutionalized memory, while everyday life transmits memories that are lived and therefore embodied. Monuments as constructions of cultural memory are linked to the self-image of a place. It is imperative that they be examined critically to assure that, his that history in all of its multiplicity is articulated. This is the project of Monument Lab, an art and history collective that I co-founded in 2012 in Philadelphia along with my colleague, Dr. Paul Farber. We are living in a public space moment Public space and public facilities have changed greatly over the course of the last several months due to physical distancing and the disappearance of spaces for communal connectivity and identity. 
It is not just a morbidity produced public space crisis, but a crisis exacerbated by the privatization and deterioration of true public space. Sorry, I just lost myself. By true public space, I mean a space that admits a wide range of spatial practices and that are generative of sustained public dialogue. Closed circuit television surveillance along with data harvesting and monitoring are, for, are further heightening the crisis of public space. Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, Le Mouvement des Gilets Jaunes, or Yellow Vests, and the pandemic's exposing of societal inequality between those who must go to work and those who can work from home underline the profoundly political and ideological character of space itself. It is impossible to think about the human body as separate from space and the workings of power. Michel Foucault argued that power functions to discipline bodies as part of the management of societies and its populations. Societies today privilege those with money, while agricultural workers, fast food workers, daycare workers, and those who work in so-called low status yet indispensable jobs have their labor squeezed to the lowest dollar. The French sociologist Henri Lefebvre wrote that space is a product of the human body, what he called spatial practice. But he also treated space as three-pronged, bodily or lived space, perceived space, and conceived space. Resistance starts with the corporeal ability to pr produce space. This ability is the means by which people can take power back in their everyday lives. For the artist, it is crucial to not just acknowledge capitalism and its productive aspects, but to challenge it at every turn. Such an acknowledgement is vital because art production is always in negotiation with the prevailing ideologies of a given social order. Art is, is important because it is a practice that can open up a space free from the hegemony of a culture of exchange value. All socio-political and economic applications, including public art, happen in a spatial context. But space can be defined in any number of ways. Depending on the theoretical framework and discipline, spaces are defined by semiotic and material interactions that act across different agencies or dimensions, media, public space, social sphere, ecology, financial networks, etc. The anthropologist Arjuna Paderai has referred to these agencies as global cultural flows relating to the movements of people, media, technology, capital, and ideology, or as he framed it, ethnoscapes, mediascapes, technoscapes, financescapes, and idioscapes. There are many other flows, but these predominate and they circulate rhizomically in a complex overlapping and disjunctive order that both shape and disrupt the ways in which we understand the world and our place within it. Since the advent of the internet and telephonic uh, technologies, the potential for engaging with the world in ways both critical and creative has exploded. All kinds of new information technologies have emerged to augment new subjectivities forced to negotiate the relationship between material embodiment and virtual reality. Electronic mediation offers up to individuals the allure of escaping the physicality of the world and creating a sense of self that is disembodied. But as the literary critic Anne Catherine Hales has written, cyberspace represents a quantum leap forward into the technological construction of vision. Instead of an embodied consciousness looking through a window at a scene, consciousness moves through the screen to become the point of view, leaving behind the body as an unoccupied shell. 
while Hayes acknowledged the potential of new technological forms to open new ways of perceiving and being perceived, she cautioned that information like humanity cannot exist apart from the embodiment that brings it into being as a material entity in the world. And embodiment is always instantiated, local and specific. Art is always the vicissitudes of embodiment and the instantiated, local and specific character of subject formation. As Roland Barth has written about the operations of the text, which I apply here to the operations of art, the text does not stop at literature. It cannot be contained in a hierarchy, even in a simple division of genres. What constitutes the text is, on the contrary, or precisely, its subversive nature, its subversive force, force in respect of the old classifications. This is how I believe the public artist must act to respond as a subversive force to the spatial disruption of our times is to challenge what Doreen Massey referred to as the persistent attempts by hegemonic power to sanitize and sentimentalize specific heritages. Confederate monuments and statues to uh, Confederate uh, statues and monuments to genocide perpetrators are examples of sanitized heritages. They convey an idealized notion of a time past when places were supposedly characterized by coherence and unified communities. Such false notions should not detract from the genuine yearning felt by many for community. This yearning is a symptom of the immense fracturings that assault our common experience of space and place. This has been palpably highlighted by the pandemic. We are living in a time when people no longer shake hands or hug. The cultural critic Michel de Certeau famously stated that space is practice place. Space is the putting into action of a place, whereas, whereas place is ideologically inscribed and geographically fixed. Space is generated by the activities of the user, while place is a cultural construct linked to physical space. Place has predetermined meanings, while space is openly defined until it is practiced upon. Urban planning, according to Michel de Certeau, is counterposed by walking. De Certeau stated, to walk is to lack a place. It is the indefinite process of being absent and in search of an, of an appropriation. The moving about that the city multiplies and concentrates makes the city itself an immense social experience of lacking a place, an experience that is, to be sure, broken up into countless tiny deportations, displacements, and walks, compensated for by the relationships and intersections of those exoduses that intertwine and create an urban fabric, and placed under the sign of what ought to be ultimately the place, but is only a name, the city. Public art can and must contribute to the idea of taking back the city and regenerating public life. As all public art is in dialogue with all other public art symbols and edifices of the city, public art should aim to connect neighborhoods across the city, including bridging its many socioeconomic and racial divides. The present moment is perilous but it is one, it is full of the possibility of hope of cha and for change. For this presentation, I thought it timely and worthwhile to list a roster of some of the most vital issues confronting public art today, the aim of which is to provide precepts for thoughts. Perhaps to list a roster is the wrong phrasing. My goal here is to present a constellation of terms, what the situationist intellectual Guy Debord might call a psychogeography of terms. 
one that functions not as in a real map providing geospatial information, but as an unofficial map drawing from my own lived experiences of public art. Lived experiences allow us to distinguish between meanings that are assigned and meanings that are experienced firsthand. The constellation I will present is meant to evoke a picture of terms rather than a syntactical composition. I believe that the salience of public art is more nonverbal than verbal. It's affectivity resting on a foundation of visual and extralingual thinking. So without further ado, here's my constellation of terms that I think are vital to any thinking about public art. Um, I preface that it is by no means exhaustive. After the presentation of terms, I will uh, return back to the um, keynote speech. Can everyone see that? Well, I just can't see anyone, so I'm assuming yes. Okay, the first term to consider is public. What kind of public is constituted by the space in, in which the work is to be cited? The public is both an idea and a reality. It is a complex term. It is never monolithic, even in the most apparently uniform spaces. A public suggests active participation and diverse participation. In public art, it suggests active participation in the aesthetic and symbolic processes of art in public space. Yet the public must always be thought of as, as a uh, negotiated term by the artist. So I'm, I'm just showing you, this is just to, to illustrate, obviously it's the wings of Samothrace in, in, uh, in the Louvre and you see the audience um, or the public in front and, and uh, you cannot make a, um, uh, a, a template out of, uh, out of characterizing this public as somehow unitary. The uh, second term is space. And I have a, a subtitle here, space in urban settings today is marked by occupation. Space is not just an element having to do with what is in or around and in artistic forms and shapes. Space is also socially produced according to spatial practices. Space is multidimensional and multi-layered. It is defined by political, social, and institutional capacities. Space in urban settings today is marked by occupation, not just in economic and political terms, but by a corresponding cultural code that reaffirms those economic and political terms. I'm just showing you here um, what I mean by that. Uh, this is obviously from uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street, and this is a picture of Sukati Park, uh, which is a kind of private park a privately owned park that's a kind of a gift to um, to the city uh, for uh, development rights. It's actually owned by a Canadian company, Brookfield. And uh, when Occupy um, uh, Wall Street first started, it was actually in a public park that was run by the city. It was Bowling Green Park, which is only about a block uh, further north of Sukati Park. And uh, so, but what happened was uh, the uh, Bowling Green Park, which was the more public or officially public park was, um, was had certain hours and uh, the police maintained those hours and and uh, pe and people were not allowed to uh, occupy overnight uh, Bowling Green Park and so they occupied Sukati Park and Sukati Park as I said is a private park right so this is how, this is just to illustrate something of the fluidity between um, public and private in in so-called public spaces today. The third term is social space. And I have the subtitle, space is not a thing and not a container. It is a product and a means of production. According to Lefebvre, all space is social. It is a social reality and a set of relations and forms. 
a social space has physical borders and conceptual borders that are socially produced, but always interpenetrates and superimposes other spaces. That is, a social space is, can never be fully isolated and autonomous from other sp social spaces. Humans practice, uh, humans spatially practice, he, no, human spatial practice leave traces that are both symbolic and practical. In pre-modern societies, space and uh, place were much more uh, closely connected than today. Oops, I've got... But modernity has increasingly torn space away from place. Um, I'm just showing you um, uh, 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 the next term is site. Site is, um, and, but I also want to show you this by Pierre Bourdieu. There's many uh, of these, I'm sure many of you've seen these, where you have a kind of mapping grid and uh, a, this is uh, people who are more penurious, less uh, money, more money, and you see the doctors, lawyers, the chairmen, and so on, they occupy uh, these, this tier here. And then here, uh, it's got another uh, 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 tethering of two terms, uh, cultural capital and cultural capital less. And so the cultural capital less are the farmers and so on. And, um, and then the uh, cultural capital are like journalists and so on. So and, and it's kind of a uh, conceptual gridding, map gridding in terms of how social space is partitioned according to um, money, uh, income, class, and so on. And here's, here's another one, right? And this is, uh, I'm sure you've seen these. Uh, this is um, just applying concepts of habitus, that is uh, the kind of re re reaffirming of the unspoken rules by which society internalized uh, and uh, are told how to, and directed in terms of how they should conduct themselves as citizens um, and, uh, and capital to analyze gender differences in a undergraduate physics program. And the orange would stand for the female, the blue stands for the uh, male, and so on. Sight. Sight is more than a specific location. It is a node of embodiment for artistic experience and for, for potential narratives of the disenfranchised stories and voices that physically form the core of a site sociality. For any site, it is important for the public artist to examine the degree of its sociality. Site is also produced amid an, an array of possible choices and criteria to organize the world. So by sociality, what I mean by that is that for any given site, even if it's a site that looks like quite mundane, let's just say uh, a site that uh, is a typical uh, uh, suburban cul-de-sac, there's a very complex sociality in terms of the people who lived there before the, uh, the cul-de-sac development, the, uh, nat even the uh, flora and fauna that existed there, the uh, kind of uh, pilgrimage route of history that may have traversed that area, the agricultural uh, uh, farmers that may have tilled the soil before the cul-de-sac, and um, even within those, uh, the uh, terms of the uh, uh, post uh, building the cul-de-sac, you would have uh, very likely several families moving in and moving out according to different demographics. All of that constitutes a site's uh, sociality. And here I'm just, uh, again, just to illustrate the sites, this is a fantastic uh, public artwork that was done in 1985 by Horst Hoheisel, and this is uh, in Kassel, Germany. Uh, for the document to eight. And this is uh, on the right is the original Sigmund Ashtrock fountain um, done in, uh, paid for by an industrialist, a Jewish industrialist named Sigmund Ashtrock in 1908. And um, in 1939 was taken down by the Nazis because of its um, uh, uh, association with the, with the Jewish sponsor. And so what, um, uh, so what Horst um, Hoheisel did was to recreate the fountain, right? at least a kind of a template of the fountain, and then bury the template upside down into the ground where it once stood. 
And so you see here, the man is actually looking into negative space and it goes all the way down to the exact same height uh, in depth as the original fountain. And moreover, it spouts water. And so way at the very bottom there, you, you'll see water and the water is kind of retrieved and runs back up to the, you can see in these channels here where my cursor is, that's this water here, but it's inver inverted and so on. History. There is dominant history and there are sub subjugated histories. History is commonly understood as is commonly understood is single perspective narratives of the past. There is dominant history and there are many subjugated histories. Subjugated histories relate to subjugated knowledge or knowledges that according to Michel Foucault have no place or which has been confined by dominant forms of knowledge sanctioned by the established histories of sanctioned ideas. It is important to consider subjugated histories as it was experienced within a social and public realm, whether it be in this moment or in the past. It is also important to think of the ways in which histories have been subjugated because even the terms of the subjugation, the methods by which histories are subjugated uh, is interesting in itself with its own history. Um, I'm bringing this up because Egerton uh, Ryerson, um, you know, uh, Ryerson University, he was a proponent and one of the thinkers behind who uh, vociferously argued on behalf of residential schools for uh, um, ind Indigenous and First Nations children. And, and so th that's uh, one of its histories, which I think, uh, um, you know, calls uh, forth as a challenge in terms of how do we reconcile that? Are there, what are the uh, methods by which we uh, deal with this issue, uh, whether it's by removal or, or how do we tell the story and, and so on. Mediation. And this is important when you are um, submitting or interested in uh, replying to an RFQ for a public art competition. Who are the players and parties with a vested say in the public art project? Is it a development company? Is it the city? These players can have conflicting or compounding interests. The most important question is who ultimately does the public art project serve? These are very important questions for the public artists to ask. And this is just an example of a call for artists. Non-art. Today, public art competes visually with so many visually capturing manifestations that are non-art. What makes non-art spectacle so effective in securing attention? It's important to learn and study and be interested in the operations of non-art, the way they function, the way they, they call forth the uh, viewer and, and the way they demand participation, if only for lessons in terms of art. And here's uh, an image uh, from um, uh, Nuit Blanche Toronto. Um, historical preservation. While historical preservation has become a trope in public art, a story that deserves to be told need not be told in familiar ways. It should be told in a way that preserves a dimension of the untold and cannot be told. So I just showed you, I'm showing you this. This is uh, in Philadelphia, Stone Age in America. And um, this is the first public artwork commissioned by the Fairmont Park Conservancy, which was the first public art program um, anywhere, actually, in the, in, at least in the modern sense. And, and with the funding, they decided to um, purchase this. And the reason why they started a public art program was because in the 19th century, Philadelphia uh, was known as uh, uh, the factory to the world. And uh, what that meant was a lot of industrial accidents, lots of uh, worker deaths. The Schuylkill River was regularly on fire. 
lots of toxins in the air, and it was uh, intolerable. Workers were working many hours um, a day, including Saturdays, and they would only have Sunday off. And so the uh, wives of the uh, captains of industry of Philadelphia got together and formed an art association for the public good. And they, uh, and they uh, wanted, they, they, they believed in the idea that public art had a salubrious effect on the workers. And that if only the workers would have something to contemplate through art, public art, then they would feel a lot better um, about working in their miserable jobs. And so the first uh, work ever purchased was called Stone Age in America, which is ironic because it's premised on the idea of a, an epoch prior to industrialization. The same industrialization in Philadelphia, which uh, was causing literally hundreds of deaths uh, a year due to accidents and, and illness and so on. And so, and of course, there's a double irony here because Stone Age in America plays up the trope of the noble savage. And here you see a Native American woman holding on to a, 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 a child who still wants to nurse. There's another child at her foot and she has just clubbed a wolf that tried to attack the, uh, her kids and so on. And so, um, and of course, uh, it's ironic because of the uh, implications of, uh, uh, of genocide that made, uh, that prepared the way for industrialization uh, and urbanization. Autonomy. Think of public art that can get outside the realm of institutionalization. Is it possible for public art to get outside the realm of institutionalization, even if it means temporarily so? Is it possible for a public art, for a public art that returns art to some notion of the sacred? And what I mean by that is not a sacred in any religious sense, but one that is connected to everyday space and time everyday experience and ritual. Thinking of public art in this way can interject the idea of public movement as pilgrimage, as a negotiation between the sacred and the everyday. It is on one's way to work that public art exists and it becomes sacred in a truly public sense. This juncture, oh, I'm not gonna show, this is just uh, Banksy's uh, Dismaland just to, Show, uh, I think I have that in the wrong order. Okay, disjunction. Think of the idea for the work as a disjunctive force within the semantic field at play for a site. Think of public art as an indeterminate term that defies being claimed, that plays off the heterotopias of the space. Public art is something shared in time and space one which necessarily involves the sharing of anxieties. So I'm just going to quickly here, this is the uh, monument to the uh, people's heroes in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. And uh, this is uh, to illustrate the, the point about disjunction. Now, this was a officially sanctioned idea of Mao Zedong himself. And uh, it was erected in, in the, uh, about 57, 1957. Right. And uh, on the uh, frieze of, uh, uh, at, that's at the base of the column, you see this image here of students, right? And these students were rebelling against the Chinese government of the day in 1919, in the so-called May 4th, 1919 student rebellion. And then along the, the side here, you see the, this text here, written uh, or inscribed uh, in the style of Mao Zedong's handwriting. It says, one of the uh, lines says, eternal glory to the heroes of the people who from 1840 laid down their lives in the many struggles against domestic and foreign enemies and for national independence and the freedom and well-being of the people. Now, this is a kind of disjunction within, contained within the kind of a officially sanctioned form of a work. And that created a kind of opening and a kind of a problem because whenever there were uh, protests against the government, students especially would seek sanctuary by crowding around the base of this column because within the terms of the work itself, Mao Zedong gave permission for people to gather. 
And when Tiananmen Square in 1989, the events of Tiananmen Square happened, the, the first place they gathered was here. The, this was well before the goddess of democracy. Right? So, so it's very important to really study monuments and uh, statuary, really understand them uh, iconographically, including how in certain instances, form and content um, operate in very opposite ways. Heterotopias. Heterotopias are spaces that are imbued. Uh, heterotopias are places that defy the common perceptions of ordering or of a certain logic. Heterotopias are spaces that are imbued with multiple spaces in one. A heterotopia is about difference and heterogeneity, where otherness and difference is granted the space to exist. They are spaces of resistance to the dominant order. I'm just showing you here, here's a, this, this a stone wall in the site of a, 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 a police raid, um, a, a gay bar, very famous, and, and, and so on. And that would be a heterotopic space. Memory. Think of public art as an activating force relating to memory and the imagination. Memory may be about the past, but it is not inert or changeless. Memory connects past, present, and future, existing across the three temporal dimensions. Identity is articulated by the processes of mnemonic exercise. Mnemonic is just a fancy word to, uh, about memory. And here's uh, Rachel Whiteread's beautiful uh, work in Judenplatz in Vienna, Austria, uh, called the uh, Jewish uh, Library. And it's a kind of a hypothetical library uh, whereby she um, does an imprint with concrete of the interior of the library. So it's such that the negative space within the library full of uh, books on, on Jewishness and Jewish history is inverted. And so that the negative space become positive space so that the doorknobs, everything's kind of inverted. Absence, think of what is not there. What does not exist at the site or more broadly in the social situation at large? This can involve the idea of transitional or counter monuments, such as ones that are self-negating in form, such as the one in Castle I showed you. Absences call up the problem of imagined communities of whole or fused individuals and the idea of a self that is doubly constituted as both a presence and absence from community over and beyond an imagined participation in the community. And uh, here is one I find uh, especially painful because it's of uh, Cumberland, BC, which uh, once had um, the one of the largest uh, Chinatowns on, on the West Coast, up to 4,000 Chinese workers in the coal mines uh, of uh, Cumberland and on Victoria, Vancouver Island. And um, this, this all, all, almost all the buildings you see here is uh, uh, Chinatown. And uh, it was, uh, and when the coal industry declined, many of the Chinese would move to the larger Chinatowns in um, uh, Vancouver and uh, Victoria. And, but many of the uh, men there uh, reached out to uh, younger generation of Chinese and, and asked them to write to and apply for grants to the Canadian heritage, to the federal government and to the provincial government for support to preserve at least a few of the um, buildings and, and they're all declined. Um, and this is in 1963. And by um, a decade later, just after a decade later, uh, it was too late. It was such a ruin and, um, and the reason given by the government at the time was that it was too expensive to rehabilitate uh, the buildings. And so now it's all and entirely um, gone. Uh, reconnaissance. Who look up the members of the jury, find out who they are, including their views on art. There may be an opportune moment where what you want to say meshes with a particular view of a juror. Take advantage of such moments. Public art is not simply a practice but a social and institutional process which must be negotiated by the artists. Here's, here's a, just, to, just to illustrate, this is a juring of an academy show in Paris at the turn of the uh, 1900s. 
not, not too many women. Examples. What this means is you need to know and have some good idea of many, many forms of public art, and you need to know it at a very profound level. Cloudgate in Chicago, the Louis Riel statue controversy in Winnipeg, J. Joe Lewis Memorial in Detroit. There are many more. Know where you want your public art to be situated discursively within the constellation of examples that make up the ever-changing world of public art. It is important to have a strong knowledge of the history of public art by examples. The story of Cloudgate, for example, it was un it's undoubtedly successful by many measurements, but does it matter that it cost $23 million, nearly four times the original budget of six million, or that the overrun meant that for close to a decade, foundations were tapped out that normally gave money to women's programs and, children, and, and children's school programs. If it's successful, does it matter? Or that Millennium Park was built over rail tracks that enhanced property values of wealthier Chicagoans living near the loop. The work has become both a tourist destination and economic driver. The paradox of this work is that it celebrates community, even as it forced the depletion of funding for the public good of communities. So this is just to show you um, um, Cloudgate, which is an iconic, super uh, popular. It costs like well over a million to clean a year and so on. But ultimately, who does it serve? And uh, I'm not saying that's not a fantastic work. I'm just saying those questions are still important to be, to be asked. And I want to show you um, uh, the L'Oreal uh, uh, controversy because the work on the left was the original Louis Riel uh, sculpture, um, and, and which was highly denigrated, including by uh, Métis people, many Métis people. And, um, and the one on the right, I'm sorry, it's out of focus, uh, was the one that uh, satisfied, I guess, um, as a replacement. And uh, in my view, the one on the left is much more interesting and much more contorted uh, uh, and uh, representative of the uh, tortured life of Louis Riel. So these debates that uh, went on about this uh, work, and, and there are many other instances, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Joe Louis Memorial, and so on, uh, Tilted Art, that you need to know all these stories. Non-site. This is a term from uh, the great late artist, uh, Robert Smithson. And the way he describes it is that it's uh, that which refers to the, to the presentation site, the non-site. So the presentation site is what he calls the non-site. And um, the, the geographical material and historical material from which the work derives represent the site. What is the information that is transformed from site to non-site to site again? For any given non-site, there are many sites. So I hold up a pencil here and the lead, uh, it would uh, be a site. Where did it come from, that lead? That would be a site. The plastic that wraps around the pencil would be a site. The rubber at the end of the pencil would be a site. But the, pen, but the um, pencil itself is here in my home, but if my home was a gallery, that would be the non-site. So these kinds of um, inversions, um, th these kinds of inversions, these kind of tethering of, uh, of um, of a work in terms of its symbolic distribution through uh, material production and so on is very, very important uh, regarding any public art um, uh, construction. And here's, here's a, what uh, Smithson called an on-site. Trope, know the artistic tropes. Tropes are common conventions in a particular genre or medium. Tropes are important to know as a theme or motif to deviate from. For example, historical reproduction is a familiar trope of public art because of the conventional and predictable ways in which history is called to form. But tropes are conventions that can be used in new ways of telling a familiar story. So this is a trope, it's an equestrian statue. I should have actually included Kenny uh, Wiley's uh, sculpture of a young uh, hipster black man sitting on top of um, 
of a horse that he mount, he put it um, installed on temporarily in Times Square in New York, right? There he's resurrecting the quote, the trope, but the trope was never meant to include in any heroic way the depiction of a black person. So he upsets the trope at the same time as um, he uh, uh, recognizes the trope. Public or collective memory. Collective memory is a socially generated common perception or acceptance of a, an historical event. Public art is often used to evoke collective memory, but it is also used to shape collective memory. What is art's role in the transmission of memory? Whose memory? How can art transform an unacknowledged or suppressed memory to an articulated memory that becomes a part of a greater cultural memory? Collective memory can change over time. They're constantly being produced and reproduced by technologies of memory, such as a film might deal with a particular uh, time in history and becomes popular and suddenly the, the history um, that that film deals with becomes um, ingrained as part of the uh, cultural memory. Uh, conceived space versus lived space. Conceived space relates to the ideology of space. Knowledge, signs, codes, theory, plans, maps, transportation and communication systems, abstract space and the abstract space of commodities, private property, money, and labor. Space as conceived is the space by experts, planners, technocrats, architects, and social engineers. Generally, a public art program is conceived by planner, an amalgam of planners, uh, the public art consultant, and so on. And they conceive of the program and the language for public art for that site. But in contrast to conceived space, as the artist, you need to think about its dialectical relationship to live space. Live space is the holistic response by one's actual experience of space. How is the work of public art actually going to be experienced by inhabitants and users? How will you measure who constitutes the inhabitants and users? Social life, art, culture, images, symbols, systems of nonverbal symbols and signs, images, memories, they all make up terms of lived space. Anthropocene, question the notion of the balance of nature. The assumption of a balance of nature has endured since antiquity. This assumption needs to be critically examined by the public artist because development projects often imagine equilibrium and predictability on nature. In part, this is due to the aesthetic virtues of orderly systems. Balance and harmony between humans and the natural environment is of course desirable, but it should not be assumed in this day and age as an unquestioned background. And this is the last term, embodiment. Embodiment features cognition as aligned to the consciousness of one's body. The body is not some extended physical substance, but a locus of sensations from which we experience our situatedness in the world. Embodiment is never total, as the long tradition of the separation of the mind from the body can attest. But such dualisms are highly gendered and racialized constructions that convey the idea of man's superiority over, over a separate nature. Embodiment is the relating of one's own body as the vessel for all that you are, your feelings and your sense of constitution and relationship to the world. To be human is to have a body, be a body and be embodied. I, oh, oh, stop that. I hope, I hope this inventory of terms is of used to you. I often think about these terms and many more, but when, when I go about making or thinking about public art, we live in a world where discrimination based on race, class, gender, religion, or nationality is still embedded in public spaces, urban life, and the built environment. 
the public artists can and must respond to these failings and promote new modes of social imagining and social maintenance in order to ref truly reflect the community of peoples. Public art can and must constitute something critical and new in the articulation of a social imagination that opens up space for the idea of the imagination as social practice. Over the last four decades, for example, practices in art in public space have shifted from a contested category within contemporary art to conceptually informed artistic practices that challenge the limitations of artistic pro productions, formats of pre presentation, distribution, and space. This reflects a shift in emphasis from aesthetic concerns to social issues, from object-oriented to site specificity, and from static to temporal processes or events. However, processes of ever-expanding global capitalism, corporatization of culture, and the dispossession of public space and dialogue by privatization challenge the status of art and its mutual relationship to notions of publicness today. The purpose of the public artist should be to invigorate public sites by idealizing public space as something that can be experienced as a space of multiplicity of histories and voices, a place in some ways akin to Jürgen Habermas's idea of a true public sphere where true public opinion could be formed. A space for true public opinion is challenged by the instrumentalization, instrumentality of public art. As I've, as I've stated several times in my own written musings on art, the relationship of public art to social reality is increasingly compromised by public arts functioning as an instrument of civil, civic bureaucracy, private development, or both. All too often, the value of public art is unquestioned as long as it is artful without the consideration of the public aspect of public art. The equation of public art as, as public good is assumed as an a priori given without the question of what exactly constitutes a public good ever being defined or in whose interest does the so-called public good uh, serve? Is a public good a moral concern for a healthful social body or is it an economic concern, a redistribution of private development funds for public expenditure? After all, public art is often cited as adding value to the economic vitality of a community. Indeed, any response to the fundamental question of public art as a public good is highly influenced by society's obeisance to private property. So much for, uh, for public good being non-rivalrous and democratic in its aesthetic and symbolic consumption. A public good can indeed perform as its supposed opposite, a private good that privileges certain consumers over others. Public space, as I've tried to argue, is not a natural order. Rather, it is one produced by power relations and one that is all too often a manifestation of power territorialization. Such conditions place limits on the potential of public art to function more robustly as a meaningful and imaginative social practice. The degree to which public space is truly public has been exposed by the coronavirus the latter of which has exacerbated the status of private spaces over public space. People with property can relax in their own backyards or at their beach houses, while people without such things have nowhere to go but to risk exposure in proximity to others in public space. We are living in a public artist moment. The first half of 2020 witnessed unimaginable changes uh, change to our collective existence, brought about by the perils of a global health crisis, followed by a repositioning of our focus on two centuries of systemic racial injustice. Society is being reordered on an unprecedented scale as our relationship to the world and to each other has been reconfigured. But this is also a moment of opportunity for advancing the ideals of global public good. Museums and educational institutions 
are undergoing name changes. Demands are made of their advisory boards for greater diversity and the implementation of genuine cultural change that advances the acknowledgement of difference. Troubling monuments are being taken down. People have taken to the streets to demand greater social equity and justice. There has been a proliferation of ideas on reclaiming urban public space in a post-pandemic world. The public commons is gaining currency as a term for shared management and unencumbered access to an ecologically sustainable world, as well as social creations such as libraries, schools, and public spaces. The crisis has, the crisis has produced opportunities for the public artists, but they are opportunities that demand of the public artists the ability to imagine and see the world in new ways. Public art must function as a spur for the imagination, as critical social practice, and as a means towards greater inclusivity. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, Ken, for this uh, insightful and uh, timely presentation and um, um, giving us a great overview of so-called public art practice. Um, before we open the floor to um, Q&A, while well, there are already quite a few questions waiting, um, I have a question for you. Um, as an experienced public artist, how do you mediate disagreement in public space? And personally, I think this is the very nature of being a public space. But when you work on behalf of the city, a lot of effort actually put into avoiding or removing disagreement. But to me, this is the condition that leads to great art. And I would like to hear your thoughts and based on your experience. Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by disagreement because that's a very highly contingent term. Uh -huh. What is the nature of this disagreement? Is it a big disagreement? Is it a small disagreement? Is it this disagreement that that uh, one can resolve in uh, in a uh, as a kind of a middle in the middle ground, or or is it not? So uh, you know uh, you have to qualify what you mean by disagreement. Well, I guess disagreement. What I mean here is that it wouldn't be a unified voice, as um, let's say it's a unified and um, view towards something. And I think it just also to me and I think about disagreement is open and uh, to different voices and opinions and sometimes it can involve conflicts. But of course, I'm not saying like it's going to be a violent conflict and it needs to be resolved and in terms of winning or losing situation, but to actually embrace and that's the very nature of the differences. <laughs> Uh, by the way, the uh, uh, the it seems like the light of God is shining. No, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to think. What should I do about it right now? No, I mean, uh, I mean, if it's a great disagreement during the during the processes procedures of uh, of of public art, like when you're presenting, that's that's one thing, right? And uh, and so I have to argue on behalf of why I I'm thinking the way I I do it in order to not just defend the work but also articulate um, good reasons for my thinking. Right, but if it's disagreement, uh, you know, subsequent to the installation of a public artwork, right? That, I mean, that comes with the territory. Um, when uh, I make work, and I think this is good advice for any uh, artist, not just public artist, uh, you, I think it's always good practice to imagine uh, or put into the your mind uh, an imagining of who your ideal audience member would be. That is, who. Um, would be, I don't mean who in terms of class and so on, but who in, uh, would be, what would be the reading of the work that you most want uh, an ideal uh, audience member to, to, to have. And of course, that's always to some degree a call because you can't fully anticipate uh, in advance the responses. And, um, and, uh, but, um, and sometimes the responses uh, 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 arrive and uh, I'm surprised by the, um, uh, how they deviated from 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 my call, let's say, and uh, but then sometimes that is actually fortuitous because that can end up being more interesting than whatever I anticipated. So, I mean, I don't know how to answer that under, other than you know I have to, uh, you know, you 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 wrestle with disagreements and 
you defend what are lines in the sand and and uh, you but at the same time you're open to uh, you know valid criticism of your work right that's the only way you can learn about your work Ken, I'm going to uh, ask a question from our audience, it's from Steve. Um, regarding subjugated history, it appears presently that there is a reactive cycle where subjugated histories become the present dominant history. Is cancel culture an example of this, or how would you reflect on this um, related to your work around monuments and their proclivities for being permanent? Well, I, I don't, uh, first of all, I, I don't like the term cancel culture. There's something very kind of, um, snooty about it you know it's like oh you're just being politically correct as to, to completely discredit and completely invalidate something which it, which deserves to be aired out something that deserves to be you know uh tested in, in 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 a public context by many voices and it's often used to denigrate uh the person who has historically uh been put down and not allowed to be heard right so cancel culture i don't really uh, subscribe to that, and I also don't subscribe to the to the first uh, line uh, that somehow you know it, the subjugated histories are now becoming dominant. It certainly is not. It certainly is not in boardrooms. It certainly is not in terms of Davos. It certainly is not in terms of in terms of the you know the, the corridors of power. So, and it certainly is not in terms of the overwhelming uh, lopsidedness of representations of a very narrow historical narrative compared to all the countervailing narratives of trauma that has never been recognized. I mean, let's just take Confederate monuments. Yeah, those m monuments deserve to, be come, to come down. I don't want to get into just a debate about that. But I also think that they look more overwhelming in numbers because there are no monuments to uh, auction blocks of slaves. There are no monuments to the hundreds of trees in which uh, African slaves were lynched. There are no monuments to, uh, there's lots of monuments to slave owners or you know, slave participants, but there are very few uh, monuments to all the other accoutrements that made up the institutionalization of slaves, for example. So there's not just the taking down of monuments, there's also the, a, a new kind of monument that was certainly completely absent from the public art landscape. But that's clearly true. If you walk around, uh, you know, just uh, let's just take uh, Parliament Hill in Ottawa. You walk around and look at all the statues. It's probably like, you know, uh, I don't know, overwhelmingly men, white men, right? As though you know, no one else existed, right? No one else contributed. So I, that's why I back to the term cancel culture because it's like it's a kind of uh, dismissive term that somehow the the, the resistance to uh, wanting based on wanting to be uh, included as a voice in society is discounted. Jan's gonna ask the next question, I think. Yes, and so we have the next question from Nick King. Um, how would you differentiate art and non-art when art also strategically engaged with visually sensational elements? Well, um, it, uh, that, that's a question of um, discursive framing. If it's framed as art, right, and it is, uh, and, and is, and of course, it involves intention. Intention is art. Framing is art, and and uh, de declaration as art makes it art. Right now, um, you know, obviously, there's many moments of misrecognition. That's a game I play with my my son, who who's a complete art addict, even at the age of um, nine, and so. We'll walk around uh, uh, the street, and and uh, Linus, my son, will say, "Hey, Dad, look at that over there." And uh, I'll say, "Yeah," and he says, it "Looks like art." I go, "Yeah, you're right. It does look like art, right?" But we know it's non-art, right? And so, it, so there it, there is fluidity in terms of the uh, appearance uh, uh, and the kind of intersections of forms between art and non-art, because art often. Uh, you know, comments, makes comments uh, about the world at large, about the forms and objects that make up and are present in the world at large, right? Uh, just, just as often you have competing non-art um, processes such, such as advertising, publicity culture, spectacles, all kinds of things like that, that may have an aesthetic dimension. They, they look at art itself, the forms of art, right? To make things. And so they, they, they project the, uh, 
the look of art, but, but the intention was never about art. So we have, um, first of all, we have a thank you from uh, Abbas Akavan for uh, clarifying the problems of the term cancel culture as a dismissive term. So thank you for that. And then we also have a question. A former student of mine. Pardon? A former student of mine. <laughs> He's already done much better than me, so. <laughs> Um, in your experience, this is a question from Mary Lou Lemons, in your experience, what potential is there for antagonism, resistance, or real critical perspectives in public art projects, especially in the context of these projects being funded by the public? Um, and there's a sort of related question um, from Jessica Tallman, which is, is there any way for artists to make a public artwork that retains its integrity and authenticity while being commissioned by a real estate developer, or is its very nature, is it, or by its very nature is the work subsumed by the commercial intent or capitalist agenda of the developer. So how provocative can a kind of permanent public art work be, whether commissioned by public or private bodies? This is a whole well, other, whole other subject. Well, that's <laughs> a very good question, right? And, um, you know, personally, if uh, I've done, I've done uh, two or three works for uh, private developments, but only because I feel I have, have an idea behind it and an idea whereby I can, uh, speak about certain things that I want to speak about, right? And uh, and that's hard, right? Because uh, sometimes, you know, developers, they're not all, uh, you know, boogeymen, right? Boogie people. And so they're not all, all, all bad, right? But it is very uh, constraining because obviously there are certain um, expectations you, you know, including the uh, owners of the, of the would-be development, the condo owners and so on. You don't want something that is so grotesque and so bothersome to the to the uh, to the you know the stakeholders in, in, involved, and so it's hard. That's a very hard decision to make and, and to and, and to achieve uh, regarding um, regarding uh, making something that is you know um, subversive and so on. And so when, when and, and I, I just want to go back to Mary Lou uh, Lemons quick because she was a former student of mine <laughs> as well. Um, is that is that when I say resistance, right? I'm not saying that every project requires the same degree of and intensity of resistance. I'm saying that resistance should be thought of as part of the thought process, right? So that it opens up your thinking. As when you have a public art uh, project, let's say by a developer, right? You, you have to try to think okay, otherwise. I think that's really important to try to think otherwise. What is not allowed? What is disallowed? What can you not do? And then you start thinking, what can I do, but barely? And then what can I do and maybe get away with uh, because it's just subtle enough, it's just allegorical enough that I can do it. That's what I mean by resistance. You have to uh, have some sense of, um, of real politic with a K at the end, a, a sense of real politic in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, um, ascertaining the, those, those, those metrics of uh, resistance. One of the, um, one of a, a great proposal that I saw of yours that we were not able to award way back and I'm glad it's found a new home is the seated draft horse. Mm -hmm. And that to me is an excellent example of exactly what you're talking about there, of very um, subtly subversive way of approaching some of the complexities and issues of a site. Um, that's, there's another question here from Jessica Winton about, as a prolific public artist, you must have many unrealized works. Do you think artists could, should begin to represent their failures to give a depth of reality to the public art process? Well, I, I'm kind of featuring uh, maybe Rebecca and, and yeah, who knows, but I'm kind of re featuring occasionally my 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 failed not failed, but my uh, the works uh, in which unrealized, I yeah, you know, unrealized work. No, but that I submitted for public art competitions that were declined, uh, and that's on my Instagram feed. Right? <laughs> yeah, you post every day. <laughs> I, do, I do do that, and uh, the work that um, Rebecca uh, w w is um, referring to was a work I. I thought this deserves a work. And this deserves a site for the work, right? So I retained it. It was a, it uh, it was a work that um, didn't uh, wasn't accepted in in uh, uh, Toronto, but um, but it was an idea that I thought was 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 important to be realized. So I retained it, and uh, and then luckily for me, 
there was just language, the site, all that was, uh, it was different site, but it was, it was many, there were also many parallels in terms of the, in terms of the uh, story I wanted to say. So it, it's now in the suburb of Vancouver. Yeah, did you want to ask the next question? Sure, yeah, I think we have a question from, uh, if I pronounce your name wrong, please, and uh, um, excuse me, um, Vinicius James Valorani. And uh, so the question is, that I wonder if the modern place where public art is related to can be realized as a known place because the absence of a stable anthropology in social space. I think that may your notion of a collectivity can relate it to this dynamic exchange of cultural moments. In the end, can be the public art able to talk this not anthropological language? Sorry, I need to read the question. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what the question is. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, uh, to be honest. Do you, oh, here, do you think institutions like museums, is that the one? Oh, no, this is another one. Okay, I'm going to uh, send All right. it. All right, doesn't matter. Um, I, 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 I'm not clear what the question, oh, okay, I wonder if the modern place where public art is related to mm -hmm. uh, can be realized as a non-place ca cause the absence of a stable anthropology in the social group. I think that may, that may, your notion of collective can relate to this time. In the end, can be the public art able to talk? Uh, I uh, suspect I don't want fully understand the, the question. Uh, I mean, I think I, I can say that there's a lot of um, uh, artists that uh, are testing uh, the traditional uh, uh, functioning of public art by, by, for example, even the one I cited of the Anshra uh, fountain in Kassel. In a way, you know, I've seen that many times. And if you're, and if you don't remember it's there, and you're walking along maybe about 20 feet um, or five meters further uh, to the uh, west of it, you could easily miss it because you can't see it, you know, right? It doesn't have a kind of physical presence uh, in, in regarding the visual field. You have to kind of discover it. You have to kind of know it. Uh, it's there in order to walk up to it. And so uh, there are many uh, artists who are interested in these questions of highly uh, dispersed forms, temporal forms, and negative forms, in fact. Uh, there's a very famous one outside Hamburg uh, by uh, Joachim and Esther Gertz, um, where the, uh, the work um, disappeared over a number of weeks, right? So the, the work was there and each day it disappeared so many inches. And then after, uh, I don't know how many weeks, it completely disappeared. And so it even doesn't exist, but the only thing you know is that there's a marker there, right? So artists are always testing these and I think that's important, right? In a way, um, the non-place uh, uh, functions as a kind of critique in terms of the closure of public, uh, public place, right? But I personally don't um, think that's a very uh, promising area to work in long-term because I think you still have to deal with physical presence. You still have to do with, deal with um, uh, interpolating a viewer and you still have to deal with uh, uh, you know, um, a, a spatial practice, right? And the best way to deal with spatial practice is to have a work that calls for um, the potential audience member through its physical form, through its presence. We have um, time for one more question. And I think it would be, perhaps we'll go, there's a very practical one here, which is, but, uh, on the other hand, might be a very difficult one to, to answer, which is from Jesse, what is the first step that an artist should take to gain experience in making public art? What is the first step? Um, I, think, I think you can't, um, you, you, you cannot even take the first step unless you have a very solid uh, knowledge base about what's happened in art over the last, let's say 50 years. You need to really have a strong knowledge base. And that means a lot of reading and a lot of um, even writing if, you, if, if, if uh, that suits you, right? But reading especially so that you understand um, all those terms I mentioned, you understand how to situate your work um, for, and you know how to respond to work, right? And so that you can have a, have a conversation at the level equal to the potential jurors. Right? Because otherwise, you'll be met with uh, with uh, declination. You'll be uh, you'll be a failure, 
right? So that's the first step. Do do legwork, right? I, I, start looking at, at a book of art and um, about public space and the changing uh, definitions of public space. Start looking at uh, and deciding for yourself why certain works uh, appeal to you and what are the reasons for for the attraction that you have for that work. And when I say attraction, it's not just a kind of je ne sais quoi quality, but also uh, understanding it on a kind of theoretical level, right? And I, uh, certainly on an iconographic level, certainly on a biographical level, I I I even in terms of the, art uh, the artist's language, the total oeuvre of, of the artist's work. So that's the first step I would take. Thank you, Ken, so much. Um, this has been an incredible hour um, of listening to you speak. You have an incredible way to start the program. You've mapped out a really highly creative constellation of that's ranged from academic references to some really sort of practical tips um, and everything in between. And uh, I think I'm gonna have to set aside some time tonight to just marinate on some of the stuff that we've gone through that you've led us through today. It's been really, um, really amazing. And it's really made me think about the, the, the work that uh, Jan and I put into naming this summit, which we called Becoming Public Art, and is all about um, the process through which art becomes public and all of the questions around ownership and authorship and, um, and negotiation and those sort of complexities that are involved there. Uh, whereas on the one hand, it's this sort of officialization of an actually of a subjectivity that is either this kind of idea of collective memory or an artist's interpretation of the site. But on the other hand, perhaps one of its most important roles is this disjunctive force, what you called a disjunctive force. And I've referred to before as an interruption in the city's uh, general usual rules of engagement. And that perhaps that's one of the most important roles um, that art plays as it becomes public art. Um, so, and I think your, your, your point about knowing where you want your public art practice to be situated within uh, this sort of changing and ever shifting landscape of, of uh, public art precedence is a really great way to um, look forward to our next uh, few sessions. So I'm going to hand it over to Jan, but thank you Ken again so much. It's always a delight to hear you speak about your work and about um, monuments and about public art and everything. Everything is relevant. There's a little plug for your book. <laughs> yeah. Buy my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 yes. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, thanks again. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Hope to see you again in the next eight sessions. So next week's topic on Tuesday, October 20th, is a collaborative process, which is a group presentation by artists and architects and fabricators on the complexities of making multi-stakeholder public art projects. The registration link will open tomorrow. And uh, please go to markham.ca slash public art and you can find the link in the chat box to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletters produced especially for this summit, featuring the link to the, the links to the recorded sessions, the links to upcoming registrations, and a series of commissioned interviews on the topics of public policy and a master plan, development and planning tools, public art on campus, and public art in transit. So please sign up and stay tuned. That's it for today's session. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.